Insurance companies have teams of professionals to fight your claim. If you want to know what your case is really worth, I'm Spencer Callahan. I'd like to help. Spencer Callahan is the one to see. Call 387 Filing number 16-7970. WNXX, Jackson, KNXX, Donaldsonville, and WDGLHD2 Baton Rouge. This hour brought to you by Spencer Callahan Injury Lawyers. LA 21-12681. Offices in Baton Rouge. are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Locking down the middle of the day. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studios, this is Hunt Palmer. Welcome in! Hunt Palmer coming to you from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studio downtown in the capital city on this Thursday. Means we're brought to you by Rouse's Markets. Got Taylor Sharp and Jordan Kitchens back there on the ones and twos. Appreciate you hanging out with us here as we start working towards the weekend. They are underway at the Masters in Augusta, Georgia. We will go there an hour and a half from right now. Scott Rabelais will join us, talk a little bit about the Masters. Also in hour number two, we will chat with our guy Chris Blair. They have landed in Knoxville, so we'll talk to Chris about this upcoming series between the Tigers and the Vols. Joe Healy, uh, D1 Baseball's SEC Extra team with us at 1.30. And of course, we got to talk about LSU's spring game. Tigers will be inside Tiger Stadium on Saturday afternoon, and Brian Kelly met with the media earlier today to preview the spring game and wanted to get kind of a feel for how Coach Kelly is handling things in his third spring. Start with where the team stands heading into Saturday's action. the areas that we need to get better in certainly players that we're counting on uh, to play more prominent roles from last year I, I think we walk away with you know clearly a better feel for our football team and the areas that we have to really strengthen going into the off season. And I think that's kind of the goal I mean you've got two coordinators that are coming in that are new well Kind of. Joe Sloan, not necessarily new. Cortez Anklin, not necessarily new, but in a new role. And then you've obviously brought in Blake Baker and an entire slew of uh, new coaches on that side of the ball. So it's important for those coaches and the players in, in the response to those coaches to kind of feel like they've got both feet on the ground moving into the summer and, of course, into fall camp. Uh, Kelly did say that he thought the team was a little more balanced this year. The team itself is better balanced offensively and defensively. I think last year it was pretty clear that, you know, we were trying to fit in a lot of transfers uh, out of the portal on defense. There's a lot more continuity on defense. And certainly from an offensive perspective, we've lost some players, but it's pretty clear with um, an offensive line, uh, tight ends, a quarterback, and and a deep receiving core that we're going to have some success on offense as well. You know, that um, quote was interesting. Uh, It's very clear to me that, Brian Kelly, in his ideal football program, relies very, very lightly on the transfer portal. You've heard him talk about that a lot. And I think some of that's rooted in you've brought in some transfers on the defensive side of the ball, and that just went so haywire that it stained the way he thinks of things. I mean, I don't know that Brian Kelly's ever put a unit on the field that was as poorly performing as that defense last year. Uh, That's just as blunt as I can say it. I don't know what all the Cincinnati units looked like. I can't speak to that directly. I feel like I got a reasonable handle on what went on at Notre Dame, and I don't think there was ever a unit that was that incompetent. But I will say that, like, the defense the year before that had a lot of transfers on it, and they were pretty good. And Jaden Daniels is a transfer, and he's pretty good. And Stephon Diggs, although that's a guy he brought into Notre Dame, was pretty good. And so I think he he's old school. Like, he's been around a long time. He was around long before the transfer portal ever opened up. And so I think some guys can be a little hesitant to dive into that. But I think he would rather, very strongly rather, do it with high school guys that have been around three and four years. And so clearly this team's going to be more balanced from the perspective of the offense is probably not going to be quite as good. The defense is not going to be as bad, we think. The offense is as good as it was last year. I'll be a little surprised. If the defense is bad as it was last year, I'll be a lot surprised. So from that perspective, it it should balance out. 
But I, I listened to some of the nuance to that quote, and he's like, yeah, we brought in a lot of transfers. We got a little bit more stability in, in this group. The biggest question this fall, this spring, obviously, has been defense, specifically, I think, pass defense. And Kelly spoke to what improvement he's seen there. There's no doubt there's there's a compete level for the football that was lacking last year. And, and let's put it in context. We were playing with freshmen at corner a good portion of the season. And so they were hesitant to play an aggressive style of defense. I just think you, you, know, you have some players there with more confidence uh, in the ability to do so. I think you've got you know, some veteran safeties back there that are playing you know, with a lot more experience and confidence. So I think a combination of experience, confidence, and just overall athleticism has helped that this spring. I think this job is best done when you're giving opinions, backing them up with something to of substance. That's the most interesting piece here. But I'm not going to necessarily just talk for the sake of talking or create a thought that is not genuinely mine. I'll just tell you exactly how I feel. Like, I'm curious about the performance of LSU's secondary next year. I'm not supremely confident. I don't think it's hopeless. I think to best categorize the way I feel about it, I'm curious. It's very, very plausible that Ashton Stamps becomes a second-team All-SEC cornerback because he made some impressions right from the start when he got to campus. He played a lot as a true freshman. Some of it was good. Some of it wasn't. He's got some physical ability. It's plausible he's a second-team All-League corner. It's also plausible that he's just not very good. If he's the same as he was as a freshman for two more years or right about that level, like that's not a corner that you associate with LSU defense. I don't know which one it's going to be. It's probably somewhere in the middle, but I think there's a variance there that's very, very plausible. The same goes with JV and Toviano. Big time recruit. Asked to play maybe a little out of position last year. Can you find a better spot for him? I think it would surprise me a little bit if Zy Alexander took some huge jump this late in his college football career. Keep in mind, he's only been at LSU one year, but he played a lot of FCS football. But I think there's variables in some of the guys you've brought in. And for P.J. Woodland to, to make the waves he's made early on, like, Is that the next freshman that's ready to go? You had freshmen that were ready to go. I'm not saying he needs to be Derek Stingley, but Jalen Mills was ready to play. They put him out there, and he he could play. Like, Therald Simon went out there as a freshman, didn't look the part. He was rail thin, but he, he could play. Tredavious White was asked to go out there and play, and he could. And so P.J. Woodland could. And maybe he's really good, and maybe he he hits a lot of learning bumps. But, like, I'm just kind of curious. I wish they had one guy that you could stick out there that you knew was going to play very well technically and physically and was already a returning all-league type player. But they don't have that. They just have a lot of guys from a lot of different backgrounds. Some three stars who are young, some four stars who are older, some four stars that have transferred, FCS guys that have been hurt, guys that have been out for two years. Like, they've got a lot of different guys from a lot of different backgrounds. I'm just curious. I'm not here in early April to sit here and go, you know what? This is going to be an atrocious unit. And I'm not here to say they're going to be a lot better. Corey's got it figured out. They got a lot of options. He'll find the three guys that can play. It'll be fine. Like, I'm I'm just not at either one of those spots. I think that's okay. I'll probably come up with something before Labor Day. But right now, I'm just kind of curious. The defense is... Is the biggest improvement that's got to be made. We all know that. And as I sit here and get ready to go to Tiger Stadium on Saturday to watch the spring game, we're just not going to learn much. I don't think they're going to send a bunch of blitzes. I don't think they're going to play a bunch of intricate coverages. It's going to be a lot of mano a mano man-to-man. I'm sure Garrett Nussmeyer is going to take some shots down the field because in that environment, Garrett Nussmeyer is going to take some shots down the field. And I would love to see some of the young guys go up there and make some plays on the football. But we're not going to learn everything until Lincoln Riley starts calling plays in Vegas. 
Would I rather those guys open against Rice in Tiger Stadium? Probably so. <laughs> Probably so. There are not a lot of guys that I would less rather on the opposing sideline trying to figure out a new defense and secondary than Lincoln Riley. Thankfully, Caleb Williams will be in Chicago, and we'll see what's next for USC. But I know all eyes are going to be on those guys and on that defense Saturday afternoon, and that's why this place is as passionate and as great as it is. But the truth's to be told, like, it's a pretty vanilla outing. It's just a big practice, and we'll draw our conclusions and then come up with more as we enter the summer and into the fall. But hopefully what Brian Kelly's saying is rooted in truth and that these guys are progressing and that the defense is making some strides. <laughs> it better, because I can't watch that again for four months in the fall. Our Thursday shows are brought to you by Rouse's Markets. Always invite you to download the Rouse's apps. It makes shopping so much easier. If you don't have time to run into the store because you got kids and you got practice or you got work or you got places to be, just do your shopping at the top of your finger with that Rouse's app. Have your personal shopper go in and handle it. They'll drive you, uh, they'll walk right out to the pickup zone. You can just pull right in. As long as you spend $35, you don't spend an extra cent on the curbside pickup. Convenience right there in Rouse's. If you do have time, I highly recommend going into the store at Rouse's because it's a wonderful shopping experience. We do all our shopping at Rouse's, Burbank, and Lee, and always very much enjoy it. Hope your uh, Thursday's getting along just fine. We'll come back. Brian Kelly spoke a little about the tight ends. I'm curious uh, what he had to say. We'll get to that coming up next. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. Brought to you by LaBerge Baton Rouge. Tell you about LaBerge each and every day. There's so much to watch, and that's just a great, great spot to do it. So visit us at LaBerge Baton Rouge Casino this spring for all the hoops, all the hockey, all the golf action. Got the biggest screens, the best food and drink, plus giving away pin cash bonuses and prizes to pin play rewards members. If you're not a member, that's okay. Join today. Download and register for that Pin Play app from the App Store, and you can unlock all the fun, including a chance to win up to $2,000 in Pin Cash. All this and more. Make LaBear's Baton Rouge Casino your spring sports viewing at headquarters. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. In times of need, get a full list of phone numbers, websites, and other important emergency information on the Demco Stormwatch page at 1045ESPN.com. Bayou Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram is taking $22,500 off the new 23 Ram 1500 SCA truck. We're open for business in our beautiful new showroom and taking $22,500 off the new Ram 1500 truck. All new Bayou vehicles come with a 1 million mile warranty. The crew at Bayou Automotive is going to do right by you. Hey, it's Matt Moscona. For years, you've heard me tell you about Insurance Network of Louisiana, helping you find better coverage for less money. But it's not just for your home and auto. They also offer commercial property. So, retail stores, professional offices like doctors, dentists, attorneys, clothing boutiques. Insurance Network of Louisiana can find you better coverage for less money. They service the entire state of Louisiana and they're local. So call today at 293-0450 or lainsurance.net. Extra mile on the border of expected and extraordinary for those willing to go further, like vans customized for work or play, with safety and tech to keep you connected. Supported by a five-star sales, service, and finance team, and backed by the one star you know. So go the extra mile. It's never crowded because so few have what it takes to go there. Mercedes-Benz vans. Breck teamed up to reimagine your parks, and you imagined big. With your help, we went to work, creating 12 beautiful community parks across the parish. A family-sized water park, miles and miles of trails, and parks just for your dogs. There are more places to splash, to explore, to run wild, and even soar. You imagined we delivered gold. Breck, your number one park system in the nation. 
Electricity is all around us, and our families depend on it. Every day is sparked by the power of a cold drink or a warm meal, a movie night, and a comforting light at the end of a dark hallway. From sunrise to sunset, <laughs> playtime to bedtime, our team is ready to take care of your electrical needs. Even in the case of an after-hours emergency, the light in your life shines brighter with Mr. Electric. Bayou Ford has the new inventory to get you in a new Ford truck or SUV today. Or customize your next vehicle just the way you want. All new Bayou Ford vehicles come with a 1 million mile powertrain warranty. Charles Henniger, join us for the Friday edition of Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road. We'll keep you up to date on everything going on at the Masters and preview LSU versus Tennessee in college baseball. Live at Lunch, 11 a.m. Friday on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. Working towards the weekend. Appreciate you hanging out with us here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Joe Healy from D1 Baseball's SEC Extra Team is going to be with us here in 15 minutes, previewing the SEC weekend to come in baseball. Of course, it'll be LSU in Tennessee starting up tomorrow night in Knoxville. We'll preview that with Chris Blair of the LSU Sports Radio Network an hour and 15 minutes. No, no, one hour from right now. Um... I want to keep it on football here as we start uh, in our number one. We talked a little bit about the LSU secondary, um, and that's a, que- a, a position that's got a ton of question marks. We know that. That's what I spent just 15 minutes telling you about. A position where I don't think there are really any question marks in terms of ability and depth, maybe in terms of how much each player will be used, is tight end. And I've spoken about tight end probably more in this spring than any other position on the field. I haven't talked a lot about quarterbacks. I've spent some time at run, talking about running back, and we'll do that a little bit later as well. Spent a lot of time at wide receiver. Um, not a ton at linebacker, and we know what the issue is at defensive line, and we'll talk about that later as well. The tight end, I think, is going to be a huge piece to what LSU does this year. It's, it's, there's, there are a lot of reasons for that. One, because they have good tight ends. That's a good place to start. Two, it's because they have unproven wide receivers who I need to learn more about, and I think Garrett Nussmeyer probably needs to learn about. Three, it's because Brian Kelly has always used the tight end very well. And when you put those three things together, it's like, well, this makes a ton of sense. I can remember counting down to signing day 2023, and Shea Dixon from on three was talking about the potential flip of Kamori and Pimpton from Vanderbilt to LSU. It's not a flip we see all the time, Vanderbilt to LSU, sometimes in baseball, um, but not necessarily in, in football. But Shea was really high on Kamori and Pimpton because of his size, the measurables, and his, his leaping ability. And I do also remember going out there in fall camp, and there was a red zone period, and there was a fade route, and Kamori and Pimpton skied and made a catch up where I don't think any DB on LSU's roster is physically capable of getting to. He, because he's that tall, he's got that long of arms, and he jumps that well. But we didn't see him really at all in the regular season. I haven't written him off, and I don't think Brian Kelly has either. I think we've always felt like he was going to be, you know, a dynamic uh, presence as a pass catcher. I think it was, you know, feeling more comfortable within, you know, the structure of the offense and and understanding what to do and how to do it. And then becoming more physical as, as an inline presence, as a blocker. I think he's established that this spring. Will he unseat Mason? No. But can he compliment him? Yes. And if ever that we needed him to go in there as the singular tight end, he can do the jobs. And that explains it. Like, he just wasn't ready to get on there and, and block. And if he, he couldn't do that, and you were going to line him up just to catch passes, well, then you become predictable pop personnel. Everyone knows when he's in the game, you're going to throw the football. Plus, you've got a couple guys in front of him that can do both. So not a lot of playing time for Camorian and Pimpton, but you put some weight on, you work on your technique, you get a year older, you get a year stronger. And then I think it's realistic that Camorian and Pimpton could be a factor on this year's team. Now, Mac Markway, the other tight end in that freshman class last year, did get on the field. And I think that's because he is more capable of putting a hand in the dirt and dealing with SEC defensive linemen. Not saying he dominates them, but he's more, he was more prepared when he got here than Camorian Pimpton 
to do that. Now, Mark Way missed his senior year of high school, but is a big physical presence. He doesn't run as well as Pimpton. He doesn't jump as well as Pimpton. Doesn't quite have the catch radius. He's more of a, a, a guy that blocks very well and can get you a catch, not necessarily a, a playmaker at the tight end spot this time in his career, but Brian Kelly spoke to his development. What we see from from Mac is a guy that has improved in the pass catching and route uh, running. And I think more than anything else, awareness in the passing game. I thought that there was a lack of awareness at times in the passing game. Now crossing routes and dig routes and things of that nature, there's a much better awareness. And he continues to get better in, in the run game. So that's a guy that they brought in to help block. Mason Taylor, when he got to LSU, was not necessarily equipped to do both. He was a pretty good athlete who had good enough size and was able to go out there and catch some passes for you. And he did that starting in the Florida State game in the Superdome. But you didn't have any other options to put. I mean, you put Jack Mashburn out there to, to run into somebody, but that's a converted quarterback you got doing that. But Mason Taylor has grown up, and he has evolved his game to now being a complete package at the tight end spot. And that's that's kind of a microcosm of the entire room at tight end since Mason Taylor got here. Because when he got here, there was nobody else. You had no versatility, no diversity in skill sets, just no depth, just that guy. Well, now that you've looked at this over the course of three years, you've got versatility. Mason Taylor can kind of do both. Mac Markway is a physical blocker who is working on the passing game. Camorian Pimpton is a weapon in the passing game who's working on blocking. And then you'll bring in Trey Des Green in the back end of this who's just a freak. So you've gone from having no versatility whatsoever to a lot of it at this point, but it all is going to start, as Brian Kelly just alluded to, with Mason Taylor, who we talked about earlier today. He's a player that we're going to count on much more than we did last year. I mean, he's going to be a central figure in what we do. And, and Garrett looks to him as well. And so I, I think that in this offense, the tight end will be featured quite regularly. And that is one of those quotes that I look at and say, he's not blowing smoke there. That's not some sort of, um, some sort of half answer or white lie. or that, that is, I believe, an earnest and sincere thought that he has about this offense. Last year, you don't really need to throw it to the tight end that much. You've got two first-round wide receivers running around out there. You've got a quarterback who's completely dynamic and very capable of stretching the ball down the field who doesn't necessarily need a, a safety blanket all the time. He's capable of making a lot of plays down the field and making the difficult throws. But if you've got now, instead of a, a quarterback in his fourth year starting in college, and now you've got a quarterback in his first year starting – who doesn't run around like a crazy person and doesn't at this point have two first-round wide receivers, there is very little that's more comforting than a quality tight end. I mean, last year, just for the numbers, Malik Neighbors had 89 catches. Brian Thomas had 68 catches. Mason Taylor had 36. Like, those two guys combined to catch 210 yards worth of footballs every single Saturday. Mason Taylor averaged 29. He, it wasn't like he was a non-factor. This is not a less miles tight end situation. But this is a situation where there were two guys taking the lion's share of the receptions. I mean, they had 1,700 yards, uh, 2,700 yards worth of receptions between the two of them. Mason Taylor had 348. Like, it just wasn't a focal point. But to go back to the, to the beginning of this segment, like, at, Brian, at, at Notre Dame, Brian Kelly's teams made the tight end a focal point. And he didn't have Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks at Notre Dame. He had Mackey Award winning tight ends. He had first rounders at tight end. He had third rounders at tight end. And I don't know where Mason Taylor falls into the draft picture at this point. He's not 6'7", doesn't have a huge catch radius, not you know the most physical guy at the line of scrimmage. But at this level, Mason Taylor's the complete package at tight end. And I would expect, instead of 36 catches, for him to have closer to 50 catches this year. I would expect him, instead of having one touchdown this coming year, keep in mind, Thomas and Neighbors combined for 31. Instead of him having one, I would suggest he'd have six, seven, eight. Like, I really think he could be that involved in what they do. 
Now, if they were bringing Neighbors and Thomas back, I don't think I would say that. And if I knew who was next up at wide receiver, although we feel pretty good, it's Kyron Lacey and Chris Hilton and then probably the two transfers right now. But what are those guys? Kyron Lacey last year was less involved in OSU's offense than Mason Taylor. Now, he had seven touchdowns, which was six more than Mason Taylor, but he only had 30 catches on the year, 558 yards. I'm excited about what LSU is going to be able to do with the tight ends this year. I think that is going to have to make defensive coordinators think. I think it's going to occupy safeties and linebackers, and I think it's going to be to LSU's advantage. There's there's obviously a, a real spot there for Mac Markway to help and contribute, but you know what you got in Taylor, and I'm just excited by Pimpton and Tredes Green because of their athleticism and how big a mismatch those two guys can be on whoever it is that you put on them in, in the game. I, I will keep going back to that catch that I saw Kamori and Pimpton make in practice back last August, and I'm going, Whew. That's that's really difficult for a defense to handle. But we've talked about this a lot. Brian Kelly likes playing older players he can depend on. Young guys got to earn their stripes. It sounds like Markway and Pimpton have made some strides this week, and I think we'll see them coming up in the spring game on Saturday inside Tiger Stadium. We're not done hearing from Brian Kelly. I want to talk about some uh, freshmen in the defensive backfield. I want to talk about the transfer portal. We'll do some of that at the back end of our number one. But when we come back, uh, we will chat with Joe Healy, uh, D1 Baseball SEC Extra Team how big a trouble is LSU in? We'll get the thought from somebody outside of this bubble coming up next. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. Platinum Window Tent. Platinum Window Tent LLC.com is the website. It's a brand new website. Highly recommend you go check out the website for Platinum Window Tent. And we'll go back to, to the original reason why we all thought that you needed windows tinted. That's in your automobile. And yeah, it does look cool but it's very functional. How many times have you gotten into your vehicle, whether you've been in shopping for a long time, whether you've been at work, whether you park on the street and you got to get in the car and it is an absolute sauna in there in June, July, August. I can't promise you can completely prevent that. It's not completely preventable in South Louisiana. You can help decrease the temperature in your car with window tinting from Platinum Window Tint. Check out the website. It's Platinum Window Tent LLC.com. Platinum Window Tent LLC.com. Our listeners fire up their opinions on the gymsfirearms.net hotline at 499 1045. Keep listening for your next chance to shoot us your thoughts with the gymsfirearms.net hotline on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. Jake here from my friends over at Community Steel Company located in Gonzales, Louisiana. The local place you can turn to for all of your metal building needs. Notice I said local. Not Houston, not Dallas, not Atlanta, but right here in Gonzales. Visit them at their brand new state-of-the-art website at communitysteelco.com or pick up the phone and give them a call today to answer all of your questions on your metal buildings, roofing and sheet metal, and any other steel needs you or your business need at 225-647-2020. Jerry and Benny Payne began Central Plumbing Company out of their driveway in Tanglewood Subdivision. 50 years later and four generations down the road, we continue to serve Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas for all of their plumbing needs. Residential, commercial, industrial, or hospitality, Central Plumbing is here 24-7, 365. We want to thank our customers, family, and friends for 50 years of success. We're looking forward to 50 more. 
power up your next project with John Deere deals by Sunshine. Whether you're working hard or playing hard, our knowledgeable team will help you find the right product for you. Ask us about our amazing tractor package promotions. Learn more about what it means to be powered by Sunshine at sunequip.com. I've been doing business with Luba for 25 years. They're dependable, trustworthy. It's just the attention to detail with our clients. Uh, our folks have years and years of experience. They're highly trained professionals, but many companies have that asset. What I'd like to think makes Luba a bit different is that we use those talents in a way that truly is dedicated to serving the needs of the folks who depend on us. Brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. Let's talk some baseball. Joe Healy, SEC Extra, part of the D1 baseball team, joins us every single Thursday here on the Hunt Palmer Show. Joe, how are you? Doing pretty well, Hunt. How about yourself? I'm doing as good as one can be at 3-9 and nine in the league, but uh, and it is what it is down here in Baton Rouge. You're more surprised that LSU is 3-9 and nine or Kentucky's 11-1? Oh, probably LSU is three and nine. I mean, you look at Kentucky's schedule, and this is this is not to take anything away from them. I'm happy to uh, talk about how I think this Kentucky team might actually be a little better than last year's. But you know, they played Missouri early, they played Georgia early. Um, now they're playing Ole Miss. Uh, they played Ole Miss, who we now know what that is. So I, I wouldn't have. I'd be surprised they were eleven one if you told me before the year. But I'm not shocked by that. But LSU being this this bad so far is kind of shocking and. And the thing about it for me is it, it's not even so much the individual performances that, that are being poor that has, has surprised me about it. It's just that the team just doesn't look right, for lack of a better way of putting it. I get that, you know, it's hard to have good body language and good energy when you're you're getting your brains beat in every weekend. But um, Jay Johnson's teams typically have a lot of fight in them. They, they typically are, are teams that tend to be resilient and, if anything, play kind of above their talent level for stretches. And this team has done the opposite, where – you know, you, you look, you just look up and down the roster, and you, you can't quite put your finger on why things aren't working out better. Have they reached the point of no return? Can they, can they right the ship? I, I think they can. Uh, honestly, I think, especially when you look at, they're just so, they're so much more talented than the teams we pr- project to finish the bottom of this league, right? Like they're clearly more talented than Mizzou and Ole Miss. I think they're more talented than State. Um, even though state's winning more games, like you know, so there's just this handful of teams they're they're better than talent wise. So I don't think we're quite at the you know last chance saloon kind of situation here for LSU. But this weekend's obviously a tough task with Tennessee on the road. That's tough for anybody. But if you're kind of spinning your wheels on the mound, it, it's kind of a nightmare scenario to have to go into Lindsey Nelson. So they have to get some kind of result this weekend. You can't get swept because you, if you're staring at three and twelve in the face, we're having a different conversation this time next week. Yeah, and we'll talk about LSU and Tennessee uh, towards the end here. But uh, and along the same lines as LSU, not quite as dire in SEC play, but Florida's record is 17-15. and 15. Uh, What do you make of that? Yeah, a part of it is just that their pitching depth is extremely young. I mean, they've got – it's like – them and Vanderbilt are kind of similar in this way, and it's worked better for Vanderbilt. But they're leaning on so many freshman pitchers that just so far have not quite figured it out. Now, they've had some success stories there for Florida. They've got a reliever named Luke McNeely who – you know, had an ERA like 15 in non-conference play and is now like a, a lockdown guy on the back end. So who knows? But um, so a lot of it is they're just dropping midweek games. Like we saw them get, again, speaking of getting brains beat in, they got run ruled by Florida State. They're 0-3 against Florida State in midweek games, but they've also lost midweekers to Jacksonville and I think North Florida. Stetson. And UCF. Stetson. Yeah, so it's a pitching depth issue, but I'll tell you this. I was in Columbia, Missouri last weekend. And that's one thing I think we kind of knew that was a possibility with Florida, that, hey, these guys are young. It might take the pitching a while. What's actually scarier for me from a Florida perspective right now is that outside of CAGS, and I'm even throwing Colby Shelton in this, I'm throwing Kate Curlin in this, like right now there are a lot of holes in those swings. Uh, I mean, 
no disrespect to Mizzou's pitching staff, but they picked apart Florida's lineup last weekend. It, it seemed like, and look, Tim Jamison's a great pitching coach. He gets underrated. He can drop a plan as well as anybody in the game. But Mizzou's pitchers should not have been able to baffle Florida's batters as well as they did last weekend. So the offense not really being all that good, it, I think, is a bigger red flag right now for Florida than the pitching stuff. What do you make of Missouri sweeping Florida? I mean, I, I, other than the, the Florida, I mean, is that is that a feather in the cap for Missouri? Oh, for sure. Because if you're Missouri, I think we if you injected everyone around that program a truth serum, they would tell you, look, this year is about let's figure out what we have. Because you'll notice Mizzou didn't go crazy in the portal in the offseason. Like they could have done that and, and come up with a team that might have won, I don't know, 11 SEC games or 12 SEC games and been halfway decent. But instead, they just decided, hey, let's be young this year and let's just figure out what we got and move forward. So this year for them is all about can we find things to hang our hat on, to get excited about, to create some momentum. And, and this sweep certainly does that. They were a team that was playing with a lot of confidence out there last weekend because they could smell blood in the water with Florida. Um, but yeah, I think about it a little bit like, you know, Missouri swept Tennessee last year too, right? So these weekends tend to happen. They tend to happen in Columbia, Missouri, frankly. That's a that's a hard place to play. People think I'm like BSing them about that, but uh, they're smaller crowds. So there's not a ton of atmosphere. It's always windy. The weather's usually bad. It was actually beautiful last weekend, but the weather's usually bad and cold and windy. It's a tough place to play. Um, and so these things tend to happen in Columbia, but, but right now I think it's mostly just Florida just really, really struggling to find itself. Alabama started things off with a two out of three win over Tennessee. Since then they are two and seven got swept in Lexington last week. Um, what do you make of Alabama right now? Yeah, I just think it's a situation where and I'll throw myself into this group. It got a little bit overheated about the lineup early in the year. Um, now, Gage Miller is still having a really nice year. I think that's a they got a real guy with him. Uh, but generally speaking, you look at what they've done in conference play, and you know, TD McCants has, has unfortunately I was rooting for him, but has unfortunately gone back to being you know the Ole Miss version of TJ McCants. And you've got Matt Cassetti hitting under 200. You know, a couple of the transfers with Evan Flight. You know, uh, one of the transfers hitting about 200. So the offense is just really backslid outside of a couple of guys. And then when you combine that with the strength of the team, which was supposed to be its pitching, not being as strong, mostly because of injuries, uh, that's kind of just a recipe for Alabama. This being more like a team that's probably going to be, you know, on the bubble, maybe on the wrong side of the bubble when it's all said and done versus the first few weeks of the season when we thought, oh, hey, this might actually be a team that could, could host again. That's a team LSU will see here in a few weeks. Let's look at the weekend that is to come here in the Southeastern Conference. I want to start with um, Vanderbilt at A and M in College Station. That looks like a really good one to me. How do you handicap it? Yeah, I think being at home obviously helps A and M there. The uh, the kind of interesting thing here is it, it looks on paper like hey, uh, big big time matchup between A and M's offense and Vanderbilt's pitching staff, and that that is true. Like that, there's that's certainly still the case, but. You know, Vanderbilt actually is, if you look at batting average, and that's just one number, I get that, but you look at batting average, A&M's offense, or I'm sorry, Vanderbilt's offense actually better than A&M's in that regard. Um, and they're getting, Vanderbilt's getting a lot from some guys that I didn't necessarily expect to be top guys in their lineup. Jaden Davis, a Samford transfer, has been their best hitter in conference play. Um, for example, but the difference is, of course, and we know this, is that A&M can hit the ball out of the ballpark in a way Vanderbilt just can't. That being said, you, you look at what Carter Holton has done on the mound. He's been excellent in SEC play. He, again, I think you and I might have talked about this at some point in the last couple of years, but Carter Holton kind of ends up being a forgotten man a little bit in the SEC. But when he's been healthy and on the mound, he's really good. He's been really good. Bryce Cunningham is throwing the ball well. Don't look now, but Ethan McIlvain, yep. Vanderbilt freshman phenom, is, throw, is starting to throw the ball really well right now. Seems like they have something with him. Wouldn't shock me if we look up in May and he's getting starts. That, that's based on no inside information. That's just Joe's hunch about it. Um, so I think the Vanderbilt pitching staff and the Vanderbilt team in general, we got really down on them after that South Carolina series, but I have a sneaking suspicion this team's on a run right now and, and is playing really well. Wouldn't shock me to see them beat A&M. That being said, like A&M's probably as much of a sure thing in the SEC right now other than Arkansas as we have. So it, definitely going to be a fun series. I'm not even sure if this is a question, just an observation, and I'm curious your thoughts on it. We know that LSU's been awful in Game 3s. They've been run-ruled three different times, but I, I would say that they faced Gerangelo Sanja, Brady Tigert, um, Carter Holton, and Jack Caglione on, in Game 3s. Like, that's... 
I don't think that happened like six or seven years ago. Yeah, you're right. And it's, it's so funny because only one of those is a guy who generally pitches on Sundays. Right. Right. With tags yeah. pitches on. The other three guys were just kind of functions of where things fell in the rotation at that point. I don't think any of them are throwing on Sundays right now as we speak. So, yeah, I mean, that is just kind of a bad luck thing. But it, it does speak a little bit to, um, you know, maybe something I'll, I'll have to think. Maybe I'll ask some folks around the league about this because I, I sense this is the case. It feels like we're getting a little more in this league. Um, teams thinking differently about the rotations. Now, you still want a dude on Fridays. I don't think that's going to change. But in terms of Saturday versus Sunday or how to handle the Thursday to Saturday series, I do wonder if the league is just thinking about rotations a little bit differently now and how player pitchers might pitch off of different guys. So you want the soft tosser on Saturday, for example. Let's throw the guy with the second best stuff on Sunday to give him different looks. You know, I don't know. But but I, I do sense that there is something a little different happening with rotations because it does feel like we have had a lot of shifting this season that we didn't necessarily have in season past. Like when you're LSU and one of one of those four guys is waiting at the end of the series, like you have to win the first two or you're really up against it. And they've they've been really up against it because they haven't won the first two. So that's why they're sitting here without yeah. a series win as we sit here. All right, let's talk Tigers uh, in Knoxville. You mentioned that lineup in that ballpark. Um, good luck, guys. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's amazing, too. They haven't had Billy Amick, Tennessee, right. you know, for the last couple of weeks, and they really haven't missed a beat. I mean, it's it's kind of absurd. I, people, I, I thought they were probably going to have the best lineup going into the season, but now it feels like folks I talk to around the league are starting to come around on that. Because early early on, you were getting some votes for A&M. There were even some folks that thought, you know, Florida with Cags and Shelton would be the best. But and now it seems like folks are starting to come around. So if you're, you know, if you're LSU, you know, that's just kind of like you hope the wind's blowing in maybe a little bit. <laughs> you hope you get some help. Uh, on the flip side, though, I think you can, as much as the LSU offense has not inspired a ton of confidence, generally speaking, I think you can do something against this Tennessee pitching staff. A.J. Causey got lit up last weekend. He's not been the same guy in SEC play. Drew Beam was really good last weekend, but he's not really been the same guy either. And then they're basically doing a staff day for their game three. So, the, this weekend might be a weekend where, hey, look, LSU, if you if, if you can ever win ugly, this is the weekend to do it. You're going to have to score runs. It's going to be one of those things where, you know, nobody's going to come out with clean pitching lines, I don't think. You're going to have to wear some stuff. But this is where, like, we, we talk about the mental side of it and being resilient and fighting. Like, this is a weekend where you show that because it's not it's probably not going to be pretty even if you win the series, even if you win some games. And, and for a team that's fighting it mentally, I think that's a big hurdle to clear. Huge weekend for different reasons for Mississippi State and Ole Miss. I can make a pretty strong case looking at their next couple of weeks that Mississippi State could work their way into the hosting picture if they could win. If they lose, it's obviously a detriment to them. If Ole Miss loses two out of three or gets swept here, we got to have a whole different conversation. So what do you, what do you make of that one in Oxford? Yeah, a lot of the line for both teams, like you said, for different reasons. This does, whereas I, I said, you know, with LSU, I, I don't I don't think this is necessarily the last chance. For Ole Miss, I kind of feel like this is. Like, we, we need to see something from Ole Miss this weekend. They're at home, although I say that, and I think, I heard this on, um, on, on a podcast recently, that I think it's something like Ole Miss has not beaten, has not won a series against State in Oxford since, like, 2016 or something. Like, it's just a weird quirk of, of the home series there. Um, and for state, they remind me a little bit, not in terms of the team, the way the team is made up necessarily, but they remind me a little bit of last year's A&M team where A&M got off to a slow start last year, but I think by the end of the year, they're going to be one of those, like, you know, it's a two seed, but Hey, can they make a run and be a host? You know, I think we're going to go to Hoover, um, with a number of different outcomes potentially for state on the board with with something to play in Hoover. But I I think a bigger storyline for this weekend is you know, hey, Ole Miss, like, you're, you're really staring down the barrel of it. Auburn, too, by the way, against Kentucky this yeah. weekend. Those two teams, like, you need to get a result this weekend or else we're suddenly going to be on, like, Hoover watch as opposed to can you get to the postseason kind of stuff. No question about it. Where are you headed this weekend? Anywhere? No, it's actually couch weekend for me. Uh-huh. I've been on the road a little bit. Going to Lexington next weekend. So doing a doing an at-home weekend to kind of recharge the batteries and probably watching a lot of, uh, a lot of A&M Vanderbilt along the way. There you go. We'll talk next week, Joe. Thanks so much.
All right, Hunt. See you, buddy. He's Joe Healy, D1 Baseball's SEC Extra team. Cannot recommend the SEC Extra package over at D1 Baseball anymore. Highway to Hoover, uh, wherever you get your podcast. He and Mark Ethers do an awesome job trying to keep up with things. I know things uh, felt a little better in Baton Rouge at this time last year than they do now, and you probably don't want to inundate yourself with too much baseball while unless you're sitting there at 3 and 9. But hey, Tigers get on a run, maybe win two this weekend and come home. I know they got to go to Missouri after that, but you could. As things change, you want to get some more baseball in your life, I highly recommend the folks over at D1 Baseball's SEC Extra team. Take a time out. Come back a little more LSU football on the Hunt Palmer Show. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. Boudreaux's Electric. Power went out a lot of places yesterday. Doesn't have to at your home or your business. If you work from home, can't afford to have that power going out, make the investment in a Generac generator. Free seven-year warranty. Free 10-year warranty depending on the generator that you choose from the folks at Boudreaux's Electric. And for that time, you don't have to worry about the power going out. I tell you about this all the time as well. They've got the technology at Boudreaux's Electric to monitor your generator remotely. So even if there's no weather event at the moment and something happens with your Generac generator, they'll know about it. They'll call you, say, hey, we realize that something's malfunctioned with your generator. We're going to come take a look at it. They'll fix it up so that when you do need that generator to, pl- to power on, to power your home or your business, it's ready to roll. It's part of the customer experience over at Boudreaux's Electric. That new Gonzalez location is opening very, very soon. You will not want to miss that. But right now, Donaldsonville location, tried and true for 40 years, is available to you at 985-397-1562. It's 985-397-1562. That is Boudreaux's Electric. In times of need, get a full list of phone numbers, websites, and other important emergency information on the Demco Stormwatch page at 1045ESPN.com. Elevate brand visibility, ignite customer engagement with the power of radio and digital advertising combined. Guarantee Digital Media brings the two together as a trusted media partner in Louisiana for nearly a century. Claim your free digital audit at GuaranteeMedia.com. Bayou Ford has the new inventory to get you in a new Ford truck or SUV today or customize your next vehicle just the way you want. All new Bayou Ford vehicles come with a 1 million mile powertrain warranty. The crew at Bayou Ford is going to do right by you. At Relief Windows, we're more than windows. We're windows, doors, party plank, and bottle siding. But our number one product is always customer satisfaction. Visit us online at reliefwindows.com. Oh, by the way, we do shutters too. Dylan Cruz here to tell you about Six Rings Baseball and Softball Camp. If you live on the North Shore and play ball, go to Six Rings Camps with former LSU assistant coach Dan Canaveri. His knowledge is second to none, and your child will improve and have fun doing it. Camps are held at Coquille Park and Six Rings Academy in Covington with four sessions over the summer. Full day and morning only sessions are available from ages 7 to 13. Go to SixRingsBaseball.com or call 985-206-9096. Learn the game to love the game. There it is, the extra mile, on the border of expected and extraordinary for those willing to go further, like vans customized for work or play, with safety and tech to keep you connected, supported by a five-star sales service and finance team, and backed by the one-star you know. So go the extra mile. It's never crowded, because so few have what it takes to go there. Mercedes-Benz Vans. Breck teamed up to reimagine your parks, and you imagined big. With your help, we went to work creating 12 beautiful community parks across the parish. A family-sized water park, miles and miles of trails, and parks just for your dogs. There are more places to splash, to explore, to run wild, and even soar. You imagined we delivered gold. Breck, your number one park system in the nation. Electricity is all around us, and our families depend on it. Every day is sparked by the power of a cold drink or a warm meal, a movie night, and a comforting light at the end of a dark hallway. From sunrise to sunset, (laughs) playtime to bedtime, our team is ready to take care of your electrical needs. Even in the case of an after-hours emergency, the light in your life shines brighter with Mr. Electric. Bayou Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram is taking $22,500 off the new 23 Ram 1500 SCA truck. We're open for business in our beautiful new showroom and taking $22,500. It's 
Excellent. Join me for a Thursday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show presented by Rouse's Joe Healy talking SEC baseball and Chris Blair on the Fighting Tigers. Hunt Palmer Show, one to three weekdays, 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Listening to the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. A little bit of uh, breaking news, positive breaking news here with the LSU men's basketball program. Transfer portal edition for Matt McMahon's crew and a guy that we knew had visited last week. We knew that was very much on the radar for LSU uh, and a guy that I'm excited about based on his skill set. Uh, it just was announced to be the folks over at On3. Matthew Bruni had it as well. Jordan Sears, transfer from... UT Martin has committed to LSU. Uh, Sears is a 5'11", 185-pound guard. Uh, He started his career at Gardner-Webb and has played for the Skyhawks for a couple of years. Obviously not the biggest, most physical guard at 5'11", 185, but he has played three years of college basketball. And I'm excited about one attribute that he brings. He can shoot. Last year, he shot 176 threes. That's about five and a half a game. And he shot 43% from the three-point line. That is gold in this era of basketball. And you've got a backcourt right now with Mike Williams, who I think is going to be a pretty good shooter, shot it really well late in the season. You've got Tyrell Ward, who we know is a, is a knockdown shooter. And I think that Sears can be that guy. Um, for UT Martin this past year, as I look up the stat sheets, he averaged 21.6 points per game. He was an 84% free throw shooter, got to the line a lot, uh, shot 43% from two. Now, these are not always guarantees. We talked a ton as the season wound down about like how to compose next year's roster and what's important and what you need to prioritize. And I was talking about transfers. You don't have to get every transfer from... Michigan State or UCLA or, you know, West Virginia. Like, you can go to some lower levels and find guys ready to play. The very best two examples in the Southeastern Conference this past year were obviously Dalton Connect and Mark Sears. Now, those are first-team all-league players who came from Ohio and northern Colorado. I'm not demanding that that's that, that you get an all-league player, but I'm just proving the point that it, you can get a real impact guy From a school that you look at and go, huh? And hopefully Sears is one of those guys. Now, Matt McMahon brought his point guard from a lower level two years ago, and that didn't work. Undersized, but in that case, you had a player that wasn't a great shooter that then, when he brought his game to the SEC, was doing a lot of driving and could not finish. Even if it's difficult for 5'11", guard in Jordan Sears to finish around the rim among really athletic 6'10", 7-foot players, you still bring the attribute of being able to shoot. And and this was a huge jump from his sophomore year at UT Martin where he only shot 32%. But even if you tell me he's going to dip four points and shoot 39% from three, sign me up. If he's going to shoot 43, I'm ecstatic. But that's a, a vital piece to building an offense this day and age in basketball. There just aren't a lot of teams that run their offense through dumping it in the post, fielding a double, and going. Purdue did, but until you find me the two-time national player of the year who's seven foot four, we're going to probably try to do it the way that most teams have to do it. And I want to be able to knock down shots. And right now, I think it's reasonable to expect that Mike Williams and Tyrell Ward and Jordan Sears are big, big pieces in your backcourt, and then you bring in a couple of guards in this class, and Curtis Gibbons and Victorious Miller, who are pretty good shooters as well. And I feel like you've got a group of five guys in the backcourt that you can really trust to make jump shots. That's that's what it feels like to me. Well, you got one more transfer, and name's escaping me. Let's see if I can pull it up. No, it's going to be too late. Um, but he's not a great shooter. The Jordan Wright transfer, who's from here. Oh, Cam Coleman. There it was. Okay, he's from Donaldsonville, went to Oak Hill, uh, Mississippi State, Kansas State, now he's in. Cam Coleman is not a great shooter. He's a really good driver, and he's 6'3", and got some decent size, and he's good at slashing. Well, guess what you need if you've got a slasher? 
guys on the perimeter that can make shots. So it's starting to come together a little bit in terms of what this offense may look like. They are desperately in need of talented bigs. They need probably two of them in the transfer portal. I don't know if Jordan Sears is your primary point guard or not. I don't know if he's your primary two guard or not. Feels like Mike Williams and Cam Coleman are are guys that you're going to look to there. But in any event, no matter if he's an off-ball or on-ball player, and we'll just see what Matt McMahon does when you get this team mixed together, shooting is just a, a, a great trait to have. And I know that I've harped on that for the last five minutes, but that excites me. Give me somebody on the on the floor that defenses feel terrified to leave. And that's what it looks like Jordan Sears is going to be for this LSU basketball team. So that really fires me up. And that man has, has brought him in the boat. Still three or four spots to play with here in the transfer portal. Now that you've added in the last week, Victorious Miller uh, and Cam Coleman and now Jordan Sears. But you got to get some bigs. Absolutely got to get some bigs here um, if you are Matt McMahon. We'll come back in hour number two. Uh, we've got a lot to get to. Uh, Chris Blair going to be with us uh, talking some uh, LSU baseball coming up after Sports Center. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. There it is the extra mile on the border of expected and extraordinary for those willing to go further, like vans customized for work or play, with safety and tech to keep you connected. Supported by a five-star sales, service, and finance team. And backed by the one-star you know. So go the extra mile. It's never crowded because so few have what it takes to go there. Mercedes-Benz Vans. Hey, it's Matt Moscona. For years, you've heard me tell you about Insurance Network of Louisiana, helping you find better coverage for less money. But it's not just for your home and auto. They also offer commercial property. So, retail stores, professional offices like doctors, dentists, attorneys, clothing boutiques. Insurance Network of Louisiana can find you better coverage for less money. They service the entire state of Louisiana, and they're local. So call today at 293-0450 or lainsurance.net. Yo, Jake here from my friends over at Community Steel Company located in Gonzales, Louisiana. The local place you can turn to for all of your metal building needs. Notice I said local. Not Houston, not Dallas, not Atlanta, but right here in Gonzales. Visit them at their brand new state-of-the-art website at communitysteelco.com or pick up the phone and give them a call today to answer all of your questions on your metal buildings, roofing and sheet metal, and any other steel needs you or your business need at 225-647-2020. Jerry and Benny Payne began Central Plumbing Company out of their driveway in Tanglewood Subdivision. 50 years later and four generations down the road, we continue to serve Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas for all of their plumbing needs. Residential, commercial, industrial, or hospitality, Central Plumbing is here 24-7, 365. We want to thank our customers, family, and friends for 50 years of success. And looking forward to 50 more. Power up your next project with John Deere Deals by Sunshine. Whether you're working hard or playing hard, our knowledgeable team will help you find the right product for you. Ask us about our amazing tractor package promotions. Learn more about what it means to be powered by sunshine at sunequip.com. I've been doing business with Luba for 25 years. They're dependable, trustworthy. It's just the attention to detail with our clients. Uh, our folks have years and years of experience. They're highly trained professionals, but many companies have that asset. What I'd like to think makes Luba a bit different is that we use those talents in a way that truly is dedicated to serving the needs of the folks who depend on us. 
Dylan Cruz here to tell you about Six Rings Baseball and Softball Camp. If you live on the North Shore and play ball, go to Six Rings Camps with former LSU assistant coach Dan Canaveri. His knowledge is second to none and your child will improve and have fun doing it. Camps are held at Coquille Park and Six Rings Academy in Covington with four sessions over the summer. Full day and morning only sessions are available from ages 7 to 13. Go to SixRingsBaseball.com or call 985-206-9096. Learn the game to love the game. I'm Doug Brown, Pro Football Hall of Famer, actor, notorious accused murderer, and convicted felon O.J. Simpson has died of prostate cancer. Simpson won the Heisman Trophy at USC and then played 11 years in the NFL. He was acquitted in the double murder trial of his ex-wife Nicole and her friend Ronald Goldman in 1994. ESPN's Jeremy Schapp. It was a huge circus. I wouldn't say it was unprecedented, but it kind of elevated it to new heights. Jeremy Schapp on Greeny. Simpson died in Las Vegas. He was 76. Ipe Mizuhara, Shohei Otani's former interpreter, is now accused of bank fraud. Federal authorities accuse Mitsuhara of stealing more than $16 million over two years from Otani to pay off gambling debts. The first round of the 88th Masters delayed by weather before the start. Live coverage right now on ESPN. The leader from New Zealand at five under par, Ryan Fox. Tiger Woods tees off shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, may I direct your attention to something quite extraordinary. Now, The Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. Brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. Live from the Mercedes Benz of Baton Rouge Studios. This is Hunt Palmer. Hour two, Thursday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show, presented by Rouse's Markets, official supermarket of the New Orleans Saints. You just heard that sports center ad. I'm still um, often fascinated by how golf is covered. You, you heard um, that the leader was Ryan Fox, and then the second nugget was Tiger Woods tees off shortly. Not number one player Scotty Scheffler is two under through his first five holes. Not Bryson DeChambeau being four under with uh, only one bogey on the card through 13. Just Tiger tees off shortly. That's That's how we still frame golf even with a 48-year-old man who hasn't finished a competitive round this year. Like, that's that's where we are. And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just that's what people want to hear and want to know. Um, but it's just fascinating to me. We'll get a report from Augusta coming up in 28 minutes with Scott Rabelais, who is there covering things for the advocate. Chris Blair in 15 minutes talking Tigers. He's up in Knoxville as LSU gets ready to take on the Tennessee Vols this weekend. We'll do a little bit more preview of that on tomorrow's show. I want to spend some more time with Brian Kelly. Audio is uh, the Tigers head football coach. Met with the media the final time before Saturday's National L Club spring game. And Kelly said, you know, what, does he, what do you expect out of the spring game? Giving certain players that are in key positions the opportunity to compete. Like, you know, we want to see some of our frontline guys go out and compete and play, but they're not, for us, the most important players out there. We want to see KP, right? We want to see him in some key. We need to see the two running backs. Uh, in particular, you know, we need to see the offensive linemen that are going to play key roles. And so there are key players that need to really get a lot of work in this game that we're, I think, focused on. And I think on both sides of the ball, as the game unfolds, you'll see a lot of them and you'll know, okay, they're really auditioning that particular player today. And there'll be other guys that get a quick hook and go, all right, they, they got a pretty good sense of where he is. 
think they probably got a pretty good sense of like where Will Campbell is. Emory Jones, I, I think I, I kind of got that one figured out. Greg Penn, yeah, I, I think he's he's just fine. Um, there, there are plenty of guys out there that have played a lot of football that you won't need to see a ton of. And I think for those of us who are a little more sicko about things, I think a lot of our listening audience that not necessarily the folks that uh, want to show up at the tailgate, make sure they see the band come down the hill, get in the Tiger Stadium, and and see the cheerleaders, and then head home early in the third quarter. Th- that portion of the fan base probably not really interested one in the spring game at all, and two in seeing young players play. But for those of us that grind it a lot, and I know there are plenty of you out there, uh, you want to see some of the young guys and what maybe they're able to do and what they look like athletically, specifically some of the early enrollees. And two of the guys that are early enrollees in this class. That, uh, that play the same position at safety are Joel Rogers and Deshaun McBride. McBride's 6'3", 200 pounds, comes from Denham Springs. Joel Rogers is 6 feet, 195, comes from West Feliciana. Those two guys, two of the best players in the state in this past cycle who are um, four-star prospects that enrolled early, we'll see them coming up on, on Saturday. And Kelly first talked about uh, Deshaun McBride. McBride, on the other hand, is um, rangy, athletic, and he's a guy that's going to factor in. He's one that you'll see a lot of, right, on, on Saturday. And we're excited about his future. I think he's got a bright future, so you'll see a lot of him on, on Saturday. That's a big physical dude. 6'3", 200 when you get to campus. That screams as a, a sophomore or junior, 6'3", 220 pounds at safety. I mean, that's a big physical dude who will come down – and, and hit people. That's a guy who can can handle bigger tight ends uh, quite often. I mean, that's that's a real athlete in Deshaun McBride. I'm excited to see kind of what he looks like um, in the pads, being that he's that big. A lot of these guys, like, you turn on the high school tape or you go to camp, and, like, they're just bigger than everybody. I, I don't know what to tell you. They, you can just tell they're the guy. It changes when you get to LSU, and then you go out on the practice field, and everybody's the guy. <laughs> like it, and, and sometimes... You look at guys and go, he doesn't look like he belongs. And sometimes you look at guys and go, oh. Like there are like I can think of a lot of examples over the years of players that I've looked at and going, Oh, okay. That's that's he he fits in. I can very distinctly remember seeing Eric Reed in his first fall and going, Oh yeah, he he already looks like he can he can play. Leonard Fournette, an obvious example, shows up and he just looks the part. Now I've been really wrong about some guys. I mentioned Theral Simon in the last uh, hour. I thought, well, that's like a two he can't play for two years. He's so skinny. I thought Tyron Matthew looked too small. Little did I know. That, but it's just it's something interesting to look at. And the other guy I mentioned in this class is Joel Rogers from West Feliciana. A little bit smaller guy, but Brian Kelly talked about him. You know, Rogers has been a little bit limited because of the shoulder, so he hasn't been allowed to have the contact, but he's been in, you know, virtually all the drills, and, you know, he's starting to find his way and feel more comfortable, and he's gotten a lot of work in the last probably week or so, and I think he's going to be a fine player for us. Yeah, Joel Rogers was the, uh, the eighth-ranked player in the state by uh, on three, seventh-ranked player in the state by on three, top ten by all the services, uh, as high as five in the state by ESPN, Really, really, really good athlete. And unfortunately, as Kelly mentioned, has missed some time uh, this spring. But hopefully you can see him a little bit in the game coming up on Saturday as well. Those are two guys that I don't think I've spent a lot of time talking about. But there's a local angle there. A lot of you are very familiar with those two guys. If you watch any high school football or just kind of pay attention to those that are right here under your nose here in the Baton Rouge area. And so excited to see a couple of those guys out there uh, in action. Kelly had a couple more things to say. And we'll kind of transition away from the spring game here and and just to the, the overall health of the football program. What is the main position that you feel like LSU desperately needs out of the transfer portal? Well, that's pretty obvious. It's defensive tackle. And Brian Kelly talked about their plan in the transfer portal pertaining to defensive tackle and the rest of the positions as well. Brian, as you go into the offseason, like you said, kind of evaluating this roster, other than maybe defensive tackle, are there positions that y'all might target in the transfer portal? I don't don't see any other positions that we need to be in the transfer portal for other than the defensive tackle position, really. That goes back to the point I made at the top of the show. Brian Kelly bristles a little bit at adding – 11 transfers per year. He just doesn't want to do that. He wants to sign 27 high schoolers a year. You're going to have your natural attrition of guys filing out, guys going early to the NFL draft. He wants to bring in 18-year-olds and get them into his system. He wants them starting off doing the questionnaires and tracking what you eat and being immersed in what it takes in his eyes to, quote, graduate champions, which is what he 
he refers to his program. He does not want to consistently go to the transfer portal every single year to supplement everywhere. Now, you get into a situation like they are at defensive tackle right now, okay. You get in a situation where the secondary was, where you've got to upgrade your talent level, okay. You've got an automatic take for somebody that wants to come in because they're just immensely talented, okay. But they're not going to focus on the transfer portal. And that answer surprised me a little bit because in my eyes, going into a fall with Josh Williams, with Caleb Jackson, and with Caden Durham is really light. Now, I don't know what Trey Holly's future holds at running back. I don't. But it felt like adding another running back made sense. And running backs are findable. The first team All-SEC running back this past year, first team, they found at the D2 level. Schrader at Missouri was playing what amounts basically to intramural football. You can find running backs. Now, finding a, a left tackle, that's hard to find. A guy that's 6'5", 315, that can move and block SEC DTs and, and, and ends, that's hard to find. Finding a 300-pound interior defensive lineman is hard to find. A running back is not hard to find. You can find a capable running back a lot of different places. So for him to say right out of the gate, yeah, I don't see any other position we need to, one, he may know more about Trey Holly's situation than I do. In fact, I'm confident he knows more about Trey Holly's situation than I do. But it, it felt like another spot where they could grab a guy. I don't know anywhere else that would be. They got a lot of edge guys on defense. They got some linebackers, plenty of secondary guys, plenty of wide receivers. You're good at quarterback, and your offensive line's in as good a position as any on the roster. I thought running back is somewhere they would go, and Brian Kelly kind of shot down that notion today. Uh, so that's your uh, that's it for your uh, Brian Kelly sound. We'll do a little bit more as we preview the spring game coming up on tomorrow's show. Our Thursday show is brought to you by Rouse's Markets, official grocer of the New Orleans Saints. When we come back, let's talk a little uh, LSU baseball. Chris Blair, voice of the Tigers, is up in Knoxville. They're all big for LSU at this point, but this weekend, very, very important. We'll talk about it next. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. ESPN Bet is ready to take you through all the huge sports moments this spring. The exclusive sports book of ESPN has it all, including offers and promotions from Scott Van Pelt and Stephen A. Smith. From the playoff intensity to getting on the links and out to the ballpark, there's no better time to be a sports fan than the spring. So sign up today. New users get $100 in bonus bets for making any sports book bet. Download ESPN Bet today. What a play. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 522 4700. In partnership with the Bears like Charles, terms and conditions apply. See app for details. Our listeners fire off their opinions on the gymsfirearms.net hotline at 499-1045. Keep listening for your next chance to shoot us your thoughts with the gymsfirearms.net hotline on 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. The Windsor Senior Living Community in Mandeville, Louisiana is a beautiful, vibrant apartment community geared towards seniors. They are nestled right in the heart of Mandeville, where seniors live a more carefree lifestyle in spacious apartments with the peace of mind that comes from having a little extra help. Call the Windsor at 985-624-8040 to schedule a lunch and tour. Come see how the Windsor can be your passport to peace of mind. There it is, the extra mile on the border of expected and extraordinary for those willing to go further, like vans customized for work or play, with safety and tech to keep you connected, supported by a five-star sales service and finance team, and backed by the one star you know. So go the extra mile. It's never crowded, because so few have what it takes to go there. Mercedes-Benz Vans. BRAC teamed up to reimagine your parks, and you imagined big. With your help, we went to work creating 12 beautiful community parks across the parish. A family-sized water park, miles and miles of trails, and parks just for your dogs. There are more places to splash, to explore, to run wild, and even soar. You imagined we delivered gold. BRAC, your number one park system in the nation. Electricity is all around us, and our families depend on it. Every day is sparked by the power of a cold drink or a warm meal, a movie night, 
and a comforting light at the end of a dark hallway. From sunrise to sunset, <laughs> playtime to bedtime, our team is ready to take care of your electrical needs. Even in the case of an after hours emergency, the light in your life shines brighter with Mr. Electric. Hey, it's Matt Moscona. For years, you've heard me tell you about Insurance Network of Louisiana, helping you find better coverage for less money. But it's not just for your home and auto. They also offer commercial property. So, retail stores, professional offices like doctors, dentists, attorneys, clothing boutiques. Insurance Network of Louisiana can find you better coverage for less money. They service the entire state of Louisiana, and they're local. So call today at 293-0450 or lainsurance.net. Yo, Jake here from my friends over at Community Steel Company located in Gonzales, Louisiana. The local place you can turn to for all of your metal building needs. Notice I said local. Not Houston, not Dallas, not Atlanta, but right here in Gonzales. Visit them at their brand new state-of-the-art website at communitysteelco.com or pick up the phone and give them a call today to answer all of your questions on your metal buildings, roofing and sheet metal, and any other. Moscona inviting you to join us for Thursday's AFR. Brian Kelly previews the spring game. We'll hear from the head coach. And Pell's Kings will preview the game. Join us for Thursday's AFR, 3 to 6, 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. You are listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. Moving right along here, Thursday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. Let's go up to Knoxville, Tennessee. The voice of the Tigers, Chris Blair, is there with the LSU baseball squad. Just touched down for a big weekend series on Rocky Top. Chris, how are you? Doing well. Yeah, good to be in Knoxville. Hopefully the rain's going to get out of here, Hunt. Um, had a big drop of the wet stuff when we arrived. Yeah. But, uh, should be moving out and should be uh, good to go for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Before we get to that, um, I want to get your opinion. Obviously, you've got some Kentucky bluegrass in your blood. What's the energy in that state right now? This doesn't happen all that often. Yeah, there's a lot of concern. Uh, in fact, when I landed in Knoxville, I had maybe 16, 17 missed text messages <laughs> from from guys I grew up with, played ball with, went to school with. And, you know, they all had their, you know, each of them had their own kind of choice from all of the names we've all heard. Um, but I think they didn't know that it was going to go this deep. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that based on what we've heard and who knows how much is true, but you know, there's, it's a, it's a pressure cooker job. That's not breaking news for anybody. Um, but you've got, and I've told you this before, I mean, you got to have, you know, elite recruiting, you have to have elite X's and O's and frankly, maybe more important than all of it, you've got to be able to have, you know, you know, 10, 15 inches of thick skin to be able to handle uh, that blender that it is every single day, every single year. And, um, you know, we'll see who's willing to step up and take the shot. You know, the reports are when I got to the hotel that one of the most lucrative packages in the history of college sports has been offered, and yet we still don't have an answer. I'm fascinated by it. I'll tell you, I've been telling my listeners for two days, like I don't really care who Florida or A&M or Alabama hires to be their basketball coach. When Kentucky does it, you have my interest, and I'm just fascinated to see which way this thing turns. I didn't think we would get to a point where Alabama and Baylor's coaches would say, no, nah, I'm not I'm not going to Kentucky, but I guess here we are. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's been interesting because, you know, because of what has happened, Cal going to Arkansas and, you know, the speculation is a number of the guys who signed with him now have the ability to follow him to Fayetteville and guys who are on the Kentucky team that aren't going to the NBA draft could follow him. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a daunting task for whoever takes over at Kentucky. Yes, it's a blue blood program, uh, but the ability for players to move and go, um, the NIL, uh, the fact that it's not, you know, there's so much talent, there's so many players, there's only so many roster spots. I mean, I think it's going to be a tough spot for whoever they hire. I mean, if they dig up eight offer up tomorrow, <laughs> I think he's going to have trouble next year. Now, I don't think they'll be – I think you have a chance to be good in the next couple of years. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think next year is going to be tough, and I don't think it matters who you hire. It's uh, it's fascinating for sure. Let's switch uh, – speaking of Blue Bloods, talk LSU baseball as they head up to, to Knoxville. You've been there for a super regional 
Uh, not the biggest stadium uh, in the SEC, but it's it's intimate. What's the environment like when when they're fired up there? Well, they're fired up. Um, I mean, I you know it's it's the last two times I have been here, uh, which was regular season and that super regional. Um, is you know since Tony Vitello has taken over and and certainly has won a lot of regular season games. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> so. But but there's nothing else going on here. No disrespect to Knoxville; it's a great town. But you know when they get a winner, uh, they latch onto it, and it's a it's a hostile environment. I mean, two hours prior to the game, they're yelling at you. You know, Bill Frank is, and I leave the ballpark usually an hour and a half, two hours after the game, they're yelling at you. Um, it's it's a hostile environment. It's a small stadium. It's a band box. It plays short. It's a launching pad. Uh, you know, and as Jay said to me Monday night at his coach's show. We know that. I mean, Tennessee is near the top in the SEC in basically every statistical category offensively. Home runs being part of that, doubles being part of that. Uh, but LSU's got to take advantage of that small ballpark too, and hopefully that's you know that's what LSU's able to do. I learned on the flight over here, looks like we're going to go gauge jump tomorrow night, game one, uh, Luke Coleman in game two, and then TBA again in game three. So we've seen that combination a couple of different ways over the last three weeks um, but as we got here to Knoxville Tennessee still TBA um, and we're expecting maybe we'll know who's going for them game one tomorrow we just had a discussion with Joe Healy uh, back in the first hour he's with D1 baseball and the SEC extra team saying he's he's been fascinated by the way that that teams have lined up their pitching it's not always just the first guy then the second guy then the third guy based on Thursday series and what Caglione's doing in Florida there's been a lot of manipulation and I think that's something that Jay obviously weighs very heavily when he's putting together his rotation no yeah absolutely I mean I think that he's discussed it publicly uh, a number of times uh, really since SEC play began you know if you look at the first two series Mississippi State and Florida it just ended up that in game three in both of those series, the best guy for the opposing team went in game three. Um, and, you know, that was – we saw a lot of that on the back end of last year because LSU, you knew coming into the weekend, Paul Skeens was starting game one. And Jay said a number of times last year at the end of the season when teams were back-ending their pitching staff, we're not going to do that because Paul sets the tone for the weekend. Um, obviously, Paul Skeens is not walking out of the bullpen or out of the dugout this year. So I think there is a little more thought going into that on how to match up best uh, against what you're facing. I also think, uh, Hunt, that this year, I know LSU has struggled with the bullpen thus far. Uh, they've had, for the most part, I think, two really good starters. Um, but when I look at the league, it, it, it really looks like maybe the best group of, of pitchers. I mean, there's so many teams that are loaded with good arms and starting positions as well as out of the bullpen. Then I think now every week you go into it, LSU is no different from everybody else. I think they have to kind of, they kind of wait. There, there's a chess match going on as to who they're going to send out there. And, and that's why I think, um, you know, some of that had to do with us not knowing what Tennessee is going to do until tomorrow. Uh, but unless something changes, Based on the information they had, this is what Jay's going to do start the weekend. Jared Jones hit leadoff back on Tuesday, and it went pretty well. Uh, do you think that's going to continue? I listened to Jay after the game Tuesday night because, I, like everybody else, I thought he's one of the few guys on this team that hasn't been in the leadoff spot yet, but obviously he doesn't come off as the prototypical leadoff guy. But then when you do what he does uh, on Tuesday night with three home runs and a double, uh, you know, you, you kind of start thinking, well, why not? And one of the things Jay's been steadfast with when I've asked him about the leadoff spot is he wants somebody who puts a little bit of fear, makes the, the starting pitcher or the pitcher, as it were, a little uneasy. That this is not a guy who's trying to lay down a bunt or get an infield single. This is a guy that may put it into the parking lot. Um, and, and obviously, Jared responded against McNeese pitching on Tuesday. Does that translate? to SEC play, we'll see. Um, but, you know, when you're looking for some good stuff and some consistency, and goodness knows really at the top of the order, LSU hasn't had that yet. I, I wouldn't shock me if tomorrow we get the lineup card and he's in the top of the order. What's Griffin Herring meant to this team? Well, as I asked Jay, uh, I said, Jay, I'll play devil's advocate. If uh, Griffin Herring, the last four outings have been tremendous. I mean, strikeouts, the walks inability for teams to really square up the baseball. 
tell me why he's the guy that comes out of the bullpen as opposed to, well, let's make him the game three starter. And Jay was quick to point out that, you know, those games where he has pitched that well, if he doesn't come out of the bullpen, there's a couple of games LSU doesn't win that they desperately now looking back on it needed to win. Um, so I think it's, that's how important he is <laughs> because right now he's one of the bright spots coming out of the bullpen. Now he did mention to me last weekend, he really didn't want to have to go to Griffin uh, in game one. And he certainly didn't want to go to him as long as he had to, you know, Holman got off to a good start, but then started to get touched up a little bit and they had to go to Griffin, which basically burned him for the weekend. Now, I don't know how, We'll have to wait and see how much Griffin would be able to handle small doses and maybe pitching once or twice throughout the weekend. But it's obvious he's important, and when the game is on the line, the guy that right now Jay Johnson's looking to is Griffin Herring. A couple guys that I, I mentioned yesterday on the show, just because we have not seen them at all in any SEC game, but threw the ball well on Tuesday night, is Sam Dutton, who has started SEC games before, and then Aiden Moffitt, who throws 100. Uh, any chance either one of those two guys factors in this weekend? I really hope so. And, you know, I asked Doug Thompson that when we closed up uh, Tuesday night. I said, Doug, I know it's LSU and it's McNeese, no disrespect to the Cowboys. But, I mean, you look at a couple of guys that we saw tonight that we haven't seen a lot and in some cases at all in SEC play. Do you think that's a little bit of an insight as to maybe a message being sent uh, and maybe we'll see it? And and he said, I think so, but I certainly hope so. Because, again, Moffitt is – is impressive when you're touching, you know, nearly the century mark. And I think Sam Dutton, who's given up one walk, um, you know, and, and again, has been able to be fairly good locating his pitches and hasn't played yet in an SEC game. So uh, I, I think when you listen to what Coach Johnson has said, I think when you listen to some of the media, uh, I know he mentioned it a little bit this morning on, on your stations about, you know, look, we're, we're at the point now where everything's on the table. So, I'd hope to see those guys a little bit this weekend. We'll be listening, Chris. Have a great call. Thanks. All right, Hunt. Thank you. He's Chris Blair, the voice of the Tigers, checking in from Knoxville, Tennessee. Maybe headed over to Calhoun's on the River for a little uh, fried food and a cold beer this afternoon. That's what I would be doing if I was in Knoxville and didn't have to go to practice or have any work this evening. Probably head over to Calhoun's and uh, watch some Masters golf, which uh, is pretty, pretty good right now. The weather looks really nice in Augusta. Speaking of Masters golf, we go to Augusta National Golf Club Coming up next, Scott Ravelay covering things for the advocate. Tiger Woods about to tee off. We'll get you all caught up on everything going on at the Master Tournament next. You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. Audio video security solutions, AVSSLA.com. If you want to hear those birds tweeting in the background at Augusta while you're watching the Masters this weekend, there's no better way to do that than with surround sound. Make sure that you have the highest quality in sound systems. The folks at Audio Video Security Solutions can do that for you. They'll come over, as Mitchell Fisher did, to my house. He looked around, kind of determined, this is where, where would you like to hear things? Here, here, okay, perfect. We can make that happen. They provide all the equipment. They do all the install. Then they walk you through everything at the end when it's complete. I don't know anything about electronics. I'm incompetent with all of that kind of stuff. But I can handle the things that he's put in my house because he walks me through every single bit of it. I've got a smart remote, got apps on my phone, can control things all over the house at the touch of a button. And it's all because of the folks at Audio Video Security Solutions. I invite you to check out the website. It's avssla.com. You can also check them out on Instagram, avss underscore br. That shows great examples of some of their great work, whether it's a the audio systems, the video systems, televisions, or security, which is always very, very important to everyone. It's AVSS, AVSSLA.com. In times of need, get a full list of phone numbers, websites, and other important emergency information on the Demco Stormwatch page at 1045ESPN.com. Central Plumbing Company out of their driveway in Tanglewood Subdivision. Fifty years later and four generations down the road, we continue to serve Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas 
for all of their plumbing needs. Residential, commercial, industrial, or hospitality, Central Plumbing is here 24-7, 365. We want to thank our customers, family, and friends for 50 years of success. We're looking forward to 50 more. Power up your next project with John Deere Deals by Sunshine. Whether you're working hard or playing hard, our knowledgeable team will help you find the right product for you. Ask us about our amazing tractor package promotions. Learn more about what it means to be powered by sunshine at sunequip.com. I've been doing business with Luba for 25 years. They're dependable, trustworthy. It's just the attention to detail with our clients. Uh, our folks have years and years of experience. They're highly trained professionals, but many companies have that asset. What I'd like to think makes Luba a bit different is that we use those talents in a way that truly is dedicated to serving the needs of the folks who depend on us. Dylan Cruz here to tell you about Six Rings Baseball and Softball Camp. If you live on the North Shore and play ball, go to Six Rings Camps with former LSU assistant coach Dan Canaveri. His knowledge is second to none and your child will improve and have fun doing it. Camps are held at Coquille Park and Six Rings Academy in Covington with four sessions over the summer. Full day and morning only sessions are available from ages 7 to 13. Go to SixRingsBaseball.com or call 985-206-9096. Learn the game to love the game. There it is, the extra mile, on the border of expected and extraordinary for those willing to go further, like vans customized for work or play, with safety and tech to keep you connected, supported by a five-star sales service and finance team, and backed by the one star you know. So go the extra mile. It's never crowded, because so few have on Friday's OTB, did the Pels manage to get it done in a must-win out west? Plus, final prep for LSU baseball's trip to Knoxville. Back against the wall. And some champagne shenanigans. Off the bench, 7 to 10 a.m., 104.5 ESPN. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. Download that Rouse's app, official supermarket of the New Orleans Saints, doing your weekend grocery shopping. Highly recommend checking out the folks over at Rouse's. Incredible wine and liquor selections over at Rouse's. I love going back to the butcher shop where they've always got some great steaks, ribeyes, fillets. They've always got your uh, your pre-made hamburger patties. Sometimes they're stuffed with like bacon or blue cheese, which I love. On the lighter side, they got your chicken, sometimes marinated as well, pork chops. All great options over at Rouse's. Um, so check them out for your weekend grocery shopping. Always a great option, and they bring you our Thursday shows each and every week. Looking at the Masters leaderboard, I'm very, very, very disappointed to announce that Bryson DeChambeau has the lead. Uh, he is five under through 15 holes. Just one bogey on the card today. Six birdies, including a birdie on the 15th hole that he just finished the par five there on the back nine. Bryson's been very, very bad at Augusta in his time. Uh, famously said it was a par 68 for him uh, because he can reach the par fives easily. Um, he doesn't hit it quite as far as he used to. He lost a little bit of that weight. Um, but he's always just been very, very poor at the Masters, and he's played very, very well today, obviously. Ryan Fox um, is in second place at four under. Uh, champion in 2016, Danny Willett at three under par. He's joined there by Ben on a big crew at two under, including Will Zalatoris, John Rahm, Matt Fitzpatrick, world number one, Scotty Scheffler, U.S. Open champion, Wyndham Clark, Victor Hovland, Cameron Smith, uh, lots and lots of guys at two under. Eric Van Ruyen, who's on my team in this big, massive, huge fantasy golf thing that I have no chance to win, but there's a lot of money involved if I happen to do so. I think there's like 2,500 teams in it. Uh, I had Van, Eric Van Ruyen as one of my guys. He was in the lead. Sitting pretty, four under par through 13 holes. Bogey's 14, bogey's 15, bogey's 17. He finishes at one under par. Uh, Tiger Woods yet to tee off, uh, or he has teed off, but uh, has uh, 
Let's see. Do I have a score for him? I do not. Rory McIlroy is one over par early in his round. He's played seven holes. Patrick Cantley one over par. Ricky Fowler at one over par as well. I do not see that Tiger Woods has teed off. He is not teed off just yet. So we'll get uh, get all of his round later in the day as well as Sam Burns. Uh, who tees off a little bit later as well. Let's go to Augusta National Golf Club right now. It's where we can find Scott Rabelais of The Advocate. He is there covering things. Scott, how are you? Well, I finally got through. Uh, I got kind of stuck on the course, and, of course, my cell phone is in the press building. Sure. (laughs) So I'm out on the course by the third hole, and a lot of people, if they haven't been here, they don't know. They, they have these banks of courtesy phones. You can literally call anywhere in the world for free. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, so you didn't, you, didn't wanna, you didn't want to just take your cell phone out to like 16 and just call, talk to me from right out there by the green? No. <laughs> you know, the, I like you, Hunt, but I, I like coming back to the Masters <laughs> in the future even more. I, uh, I agree. They with would you. swat me like a fly. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we know the weather was terrible here uh, yesterday in the morning. New Orleans is kind of underwater, and that all rolled through Augusta uh, last night and into this morning. Uh, what was the result of that weather-wise on the golf course? Yeah, it wasn't as bad here as they were expecting. I mean, last night they, they do these three or four day uh, times a day weather reports that they give uh, the media here, and the uh, the last night they were saying I an mean, inch and a half to two and a half inches of rain and, and winds gusting up to 40, 45 miles an hour, and a lot of the, ba- the bad weather I think skirted to the south of Augusta. I mean, there was there's been rain and there's there's been wind and it's a little breezy right now, but nothing like they they feared, you know. And you, you kind of had images of people probably might remember those three trees that came down in front of the seventeen. T last year that halted play, and uh, there's been nothing like that today. So it, they kind of caught a break. Obviously, it's kind of good for the golfers. You know, they had a delay getting on the course, but the, it certainly softens up conditions a little bit. It's been very firm and very the greens have been very very firm so far. But I think they can probably get them, by, you know, by the weekend back to where they want them to be because it's supposed to continue to be uh, you know breezy to windy. I uh, told the folks at the top of the segment I was very disappointed to announce that Bryson DeChambeau leads things at uh, at five under. Um, he's played exceptionally well today and had not in the past at Augusta. Uh, does that surprise you that he's off to such a good start? You know, it's just so hard to to handicap what these live guys are going to do. I mean, they, you know, just, I know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm no big fan of of, uh, of live golf, but I mean it's just hard to figure out. You know how tough are they? You know how how well are they prepared? How, you know what kind of competition are they playing? You know, they're playing 54 whole events, and there's no rough on the courses. I mean they're set up really easy, and, and uh, you know it's just it's just not what they would normally see on the PGA Tour. That said. Bryson DeChambeau is a very talented player. He was a, he's a major champion. He won the U.S. Open at Wingfoot. Uh, so uh, I'm not entirely surprised that a guy of his caliber, who has done what he's done, can can uh, you know, come up and have a good round. It, it, him putting together four good rounds is is the uh, you know, going to be an issue uh, here. But yeah, first round it's not not totally surprising. You know, there's 13 live golfers in the field, and uh, you know it's uh, John Rahm who won last year is now on the live tour. By the way, um, the the great white shark himself is out here. Greg Norman, he's out here watching on the grounds. He he was talk, reporters talked to him yesterday, and he said he was just out watching the players and had to buy, buy get his own ticket. And uh, I saw him in the gallery today. Uh, it didn't look like he wasn't. I don't think he's welcome under the oak tree um, inside the, the ropes in front of the clubhouse or anything like that. I think he's kind of on his own. Okay, I'm curious what he had to say to the media. Then I, I got to hear this because I oh god, I, I'd have some things to say. Oh, he he's like, you know, you know yeah, he, oh, the biggest thing was, he said, hundreds of people have come up to me uh-huh. today and, and just told me how much they appreciate what we're doing for golf and how they love it and everything. I'm like, everybody's like, hundreds of people. Really? Oh, God. He's, <laughs> hundreds of people. He's the worst. He's the absolute worst. Um, look, I, I, just, I can't, I can't deal. Um, let's uh, let's talk about um, the favorite in this tournament, Scotty Scheffler, um, who's two under par through eight holes today. Um, would he be your pick at this point? Oh, no question. I mean, he's he's just played. You know, he's a, he's a past winner here from two years ago. He played so well. You know, nine of his last eleven starts are the top ten. He's had three wins that time, including the players. Uh, he, he's he's and he, he's you know he was. Uh, you could see he, he was a 
a few weeks back, a couple of months back, he was getting real frustrated with his putting, but he's switched to a mallet putter, and now you know he's kind of got that part solved. And the, you know the ball striking is always seems to be there for Scotty. He's just uh, he's a machine. I mean, you know, it's hard to it's hard to pick you know in golf. I mean, even when Tiger Woods was uh, you know at his peak, he's winning like you know ten twenty percent of the time, right? So, but uh, but it's always maybe better to pick the field against any one particular golfer. But but yeah, he has to be the favorite. I mean, no question for all those reasons, and he. He just he just kind of sails along and, and look they they were talking about his caddy Ted Scott I've I've written about him they kind of give me a hard time with the paper about writing about Teddy too much but before Scotty and and Teddy got together Ted's from Lafayette uh, they were you know he didn't have a win. Now he's got a, a major and a couple of players' titles and a bunch of wins and is world number one, and uh, they make quite a good team. They make quite a good team. They absolutely do. We know that Scotty yeah. is uh, expecting his first child. So is Sam Burns and his wife. Right. Um, I know Sam's set to tee off here very shortly. We don't have, uh, we don't have baby watch just yet? <laughs> Not just yet. Uh, uh, Scotty's wife is due later this month. Uh, uh, Sam's wife is due next week. So, so Sam, yeah, could you get the call? Both of them have said, and they're and they're they're staying together. They usually the families usually stay together here at Augusta. Sam, uh, Sam and Scotty are, and their caddies, I assume, are, are staying together at a house here in Augusta. And both have said, you know, if we get that call, we're leaving. You know, and uh, uh, there was another funny story last night. Um, Sam Burns said uh, Tuesday night. Sam's caddy made some mistakes, everybody, and, and Scotty was kind of like put out, ah, oh, you make mistakes. He, he had another dinner engagement to go yeah, to, of course. Sure. It was the champion's dinner. So Scott, Sam said, I don't feel too bad for him. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't either. I think the food sounded really good at John Rahm's champion's dinner. I'm it sure did. it was just fine. Is there any tiger buzz? There's usually tiger buzz. Oh, always. Always. I mean, just the fact that he's here and playing, and we haven't seen him much. You know, he hasn't finished a tournament hunt this calendar year. You know, the last time he did was his, his, that Hero Challenge in the Bahamas uh, late last year. And so, uh, yeah, he's on, you know, on the ground. He's playing. He's, you know, he's playing this afternoon. Um, he has dealt with so many physical issues. He is trying to to break the the consecutive cuts made record that he shares with uh, Freddie Couples and uh, and Gary Player at 23 straight. So he's trying to go for his 24th straight. But he says, you know, that's not all this <laughs> Tiger is trying to do, of course, despite all the physical issues. So in fact, he's 48 now. He says if, if everything comes together, he feels like he can win a, a sixth uh, green jacket. And you don't want to... You don't want to think that that's true or anything like that, but uh, you also don't want to completely doubt him either based on what he did five years ago. It would be a miracle. It would be one of the most miracle sports stories of all time if he could win in the physical condition he's in now. But it's Tiger. If it was anybody else, we wouldn't even give him a ghost of a chance. But it's Tiger Woods, and you have to at least consider the possibility. Do you think he'll make the cut? I do. I do. Well, he plays all four rounds. That's another matter. But sure. I think he'll make the cut. Bryson DeChambeau pours in another birdie there at 16 to go to six under on his round. He leads by two over uh, Ryan Fox and Ben On. I, I heard an interesting question on a podcast. What's your thoughts on this? Is, and then we'll let you get back out there on the golf course. Uh, the 100th anniversary is coming up here in what, in like 10, 12 years? Of Augusta National, yeah, of the Masters. Of uh, the Masters, yeah. This is this is the 88th, okay, but so it, it, it was uh, it was the first one was played 90 years ago. You know, they skipped uh, you know a couple because of World War II and everything. So, so yeah, it'll, it'll be uh, that will that will be not yeah you know, not too far down the road. Not yeah. to be morbid, but like who do you think hits the uh, who's hitting those three tee shots in the morning for the hundredth? Oh, it's hard to uh, talk about betting against Scotty Shuffle. It's hard to bet against Gary Player. I mean, yeah, guy, I know. He's 88. And he, we, I went to their press conference today, him and Jack Nicholas and Tom Watson. Uh, Tiger, Tiger was asked if he'd be a ceremonial star if he's considered. He said, no, I haven't considered it at all. But, uh, I would, I, boy, 10 years from now, uh, Nick Faldo is somebody who they could ask. I saw Nick yeah. Faldo was out there this morning. Uh, you know, he's in his, you know, he's in his mid sixties. Um, you know, boy, I don't want to say Gary Player, but I wouldn't bet against Gary Player coming around ten years from now. He's he looks like he's in his early seventies. You know, um, and, and and yeah, you know, Faldo would be a good one, and then maybe somebody like Freddie Couples would yeah. be a nice would be a nice choice. We'll let you get back out to the golf, Scott. We appreciate you checking in with us. My pleasure. Thanks, son. He's Scott Ravelli out at Augusta National uh, watching the Masters as uh, they uh, look to complete day one. It's probably going to go into tomorrow. Um, they're going to have some guys that aren't teeing off until um, closer to twilight there at Augusta. But everybody's going to get onto the course today, which we didn't know if that was going to be the case looking at the forecast this time yesterday. So good news there from Augusta. They should be in good shape weather-wise for the rest of the weekend moving forward. So thanks to Scott for checking in. Uh, from the Masters. We'll take one more time out. When we come back, we'll wrap things up on the Hunt Palmer Show. 
You are now listening to the Hunt Palmer Show. One Bath and Closets. OneBathandClosets.com is the website. David Duvall and his team, 30 years redesigning and remodeling bathrooms and closets. Look, if you've got a bathtub that you never use, get rid of it. We use ours. Got a two-year-old. Got to give him a bath with the toys and the balls and the splashing and everything that's all over the place every night. We need the tub, but you may not be in a position where you need it. So why don't you take it out, put in a gorgeous glass walk-in shower. It changes the look of your home, changes the function of your home, adds some value to your home potentially. And if you're worried about paying for that, hey, they got financing options available. Check out the pictures of their awesome work at onebathandclosets.com. You can see testimonials from their satisfied customers, and you can request that free consultation with David Duvall and his team. I can promise you this with David Duvall and his team at One Bath and Closets. They're going to do it right the first time and leave the competition behind. It's not going to be rushed. They're not going to come back a month later to fix the odds and ends that they like, they cut they, they cut around the corner. No, you're going to do it right the first time, leave the competition behind. It's One Bath and Closets. Check them out at onebathandclosets.com. Our listeners fire up their opinions on the gymsfirearms.net hotline at 499-1045. Keep listening for your next chance to shoot us your thoughts with the gymsfirearms.net hotline on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. teamed up to reimagine your parks and you imagined big with your help we went to work creating 12 beautiful community parks across the parish a family-sized water park miles and miles of trails and parks just for your dogs there are more places to splash to explore to run wild and even soar you imagined we delivered gold Breck, your number one park system in the nation Electricity is all around us, and our families depend on it. A cold drink or a warm meal, a movie night, and a comforting light at the end of a dark hallway. From sunrise to sunset, (laughs) playtime to bedtime, our team is ready to take care of your electrical needs. Even in the case of an after-hours emergency, the light in your life shines brighter with Mr. Electric. Hey, it's Matt Moscona. For years, you've heard me tell you about Insurance Network of Louisiana, helping you find better coverage for less money. But it's not just for your home and auto. They also offer commercial property. So, retail stores, professional offices like doctors, dentists, attorneys, clothing boutiques. Insurance Network of Louisiana can find you better coverage for less money. They service the entire state of Louisiana, and they're local. So call today at 293-0450 or lainsurance.net. Yo, Jake here from my friends over at Community Steel Company located in Gonzales, Louisiana. The local place you can turn to for all of your metal building needs. Notice I said local. Not Houston, not Dallas, not Atlanta, but right here in Gonzales. Visit them at their brand new state-of-the-art website at communitysteelco.com or pick up the phone and give them a call today to answer all of your questions on your metal buildings, roofing and sheet metal, and any other steel needs you or your business need at 225-647-2020. Jerry and Benny Payne began Central Plumbing Company out of their driveway in Tanglewood Subdivision. 50 years later and four generations down the road, we continue to serve Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas for all of their plumbing needs. Residential, commercial, industrial, or hospitality, Central Plumbing is here 24-7, 365. We want to thank our customers, family, and friends for 50 years of success. Charles Hanniger, join us for the Friday edition of Live at Lunch from Rafino's on Highland Road. We'll keep you up to date on everything going on at the Masters and preview LSU versus Tennessee in college baseball. Live at Lunch, 11 a.m. Friday on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. You are listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. Talk 107.3 and the Baton Rouge Clinic bring you the Dreams Come True Radiothon. Dreams Come True is an organization designed to help grant dreams for children with life-threatening illnesses and their families. 
The Dreams Come True Radiothon is presented today by Mr. Electric. Donate today at talk1073.com. You know, I was thinking about, <coughs> excuse me, in the break there, Scott Ravelet saying that Greg Norman was out at Augusta. And he was outside the ropes because he's not you know, permitted to have a media badge and just had to buy a ticket and come in. And I'm 97% sure that even after like three or four affordable Masters uh, beverages, that I would not go up and say something to Greg Norman. Like 97%, but I can't be 100% sure I wouldn't go up and say something to him. I, I, I so dislike everything that he stood for for the last four years. Um, and just to see him out there in the wild, like it would be, uh, it would be interesting. Uh, again, I think I'm chicken, and I think that it's not the right thing to do. So I think that I'm 90% sure, 97% sure I wouldn't do it. But I have to leave room for the 3% that I would go over there and be like, man, would you just go away? Would you just go away, please, and bring me my golfers back? <laughs> but I don't think I would do it. I, I don't. I don't think that I would do it. Uh, the news of the day today uh, in LSU land. Uh, LSU gets a. Commitment from the transfer portal in basketball from Jordan Sears. Um, Jordan Sears averaged 20 to, 21.5 points per game at UT Martin this past year. Shot 43% from uh, from the three-point line, uh, shooting about 5.5 a game. So really nice ad for Matt McMahon and his basketball program with the addition of the Skyhawks guard in Jordan Sears. All right, let's play some take or leave it, Taylor. All right, so... Ipe Mizahara, the former interpreter for baseball superstar Shohei Otani. He is now accused of uh, federal bank fraud after allegedly stealing more than $16 million from Shohei Otani. Did he really have access to his bank account? Take it or leave it. Man, um, I, I feel like I got to leave this. I, I know that a lot of people who are in positions of massive amount of wealth delegate a lot of things to people around them that can include financial things because you've just got enough money where just take care of that and I'll pay you well and I don't I don't want that on my plate. We know Shohei Tani likes to pitch and hit and sleep. That's pretty much all we know about him. And maybe there's a situation where this guy is his closest confidant who he trusts with all of his finances and who he pays very handsomely and may have access to things that most interpreters may not have for for joe um but it just seems like a lot to me to, to for him to i mean the, the numbers that are coming out here are that he's gambled north of 140 million dollars now there are winnings in there that total like 100 and 100 million but there are also 140 in losses so there's your 40 million dollars that you're looking at there like it's it's hard for me to imagine because i'm so not in that position um but they'll figure it out. Like they're gonna have the forensics here financially to determine like what exactly happened here. And you know, the hope for the game of baseball that this interpreter just went rogue and stole a bunch of money because that doesn't affect Major League Baseball and he'll be charged with a crime and everybody will go home happy. But except, well, except the interpreter goes to jail. But you start dealing with Shohei actually being the guy who's doing the gambling and things get hairy in a hurry. Yeah, I was telling uh, T-Bob this earlier, like, maybe I'm just a lot better with my money. I don't care how much he's making. I'm going to know when $40 million goes missing. That's just coming from someone who doesn't have that much money in their account like Shohei Otani does. But I'm going to notice if $40 million Hold goes Hold on, missing. i got to stop for the Bayou 4 chat. Brent Semino in the Bayou 4 chat. This happens every time I talk about Lib. Every single time. And people were so matter of fact, I just have to talk about it. Brent Semino said, I could see Hunt going home and telling his wife he turned down $150 million on a moral stance. I've never said... That the guys are terrible humans for taking the money. I've never, I, I, I've never said that. I've been very, very steadfast. This is awful for my golf viewing experience. Having half the good players playing across the world in a format nobody can watch on channels nobody can see is awful. And I don't pull for them in golf tournaments because of that. I didn't say they should be thrown in jail or they're horrible humans, but when they play in a golf tournament, I don't like it that they ripped golf in half. This has nothing to do. I, I did not suggest that I would stare $200 million in the face and say no. I can say absolutely unequivocally, if I was Tiger Woods and they offered me $500 million, I would say no because I'm a billionaire many times over and I don't support that and I can live very well without any of that. I'm disappointed that John Rahm did this. I'm disappointed that Phil Mickelson has made this stance. Like it bums me out 
but it's not it's it's a lot of money. I get it. I just hate what it's done to golf. That's why I pull against them. I'm not that's I I just I get so frustrated with people who say, "Oh, Hunt, you 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 think people, you've never had a chance to, for 200 million dollars?" Well, no joke, man. And I can't tell you that I can't that I would turn down to 200 million dollars if I was Taylor Gooch, who probably didn't get 200 million. He probably got 50 or something. But it bums me out. That's why I pull against these guys. All right, one more quick one. Scott Drew turns down the job at Kentucky to remain the Baylor coach, and UConn head coach Dan Hurley says there is a 0% chance yeah. that he leaves UConn for Kentucky. Is it really 0%? Take it or leave it. I'll take it. I think it's zero. Um, I, I I think realistically it's zero. Um, I mean, if Kentucky offered him $4 billion, I think he'd probably take the job, but that's not realistic. So uh, I, I think that um, there are other places you can make a lot of money. Scott Drew is incredibly um, comfortable where he is in Waco. Their expectation level and his success level are very, very at a very, very happy place. Um, you're in a pressure cooker from day one when you take that job at Kentucky. Now, Jay Johnson could have been super happy at Arizona, too. Getting the College World Series every once in a while, making a good living, but he wanted to challenge himself in the most high-pressure environment in college baseball. And he thrived and got to the top of the sport. And now he's dealing with this side of it as well. And he's been very open about that. Um, that's what you're dealing with with Kentucky. I'm surprised it's taken this long for them. Um, but I, I think that there are it's a different dynamic than it used to be 15 years ago. I mean, I think 15, 20 years ago, Kentucky calls and Baylor and Alabama's coach are on the first flight. They're not anymore. It's, a, it's an odd thing. Um, <laughs> go to the Bayou 4 chat. Dutch Schaefer, do you hate capitalism? No, I don't hate capitalism. I hate my golfers playing on two different tours. This is It's a one-track thing for me. I want Cam Smith and John Rahm and Bryson DeChambeau and Mark Leishman. I want those guys back on the PGA Tour or playing with these guys. I don't want them playing in shotgun start team events in Dubai. That does nothing for me. And Phil continues to harp on how that's the best thing for golf. I disagree. The best thing for golf is for me to watch the players play golf together. Um, That's it for our Thursday edition brought to you by Rouse's. If you missed any of it, catch it on demand, 1045ESPN.com's on demand tab, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you find your sound. And, of course, on YouTube. A lot of LSU football talk as we get you ready for the spring game. Appreciate Chris Blair for jumping aboard, talking LSU baseball, and Scott Ravelay checking in from the Masters. We'll be back tomorrow with our Friday show. We'll be brought to you by Corks. We'll check in from the Masters, get you ready for the spring game. Preston Guy, as well as Krista Mui, getting you ready for LSU and Tennessee. Have a great Thursday. Matt's coming up next. You are now listening to The Hunt Palmer Show. There it is, the extra mile on the border of expected and extraordinary for those willing